On this episode of China Unscripted, many say the Chinese military is not a threat to the U.S. But they're wrong, dead wrong. Welcome to China Unscripted. I'm Chris Chapel. I'm Shelley Zhang, and I'm Matt Ganesh. And joining us once again is Captain Jim Finnell, the former Director of Intelligence and Information Operations of the U.S. Pacific Fleet. Jim, thanks for joining us again. Hey, it's great to great to be with China Uncensored. It's my honor. Awesome, awesome. Well, so we recently did uh, a, an episode called uh, "Is This China's Military's Greatest Weakness?" And we kind of talked about how uh, there are issues with low morale in uh, the People's Liberation Army, the PLA, um, lack of fighting experience, uh, even how the one child policy has affected the military. And now I know you kind of disagreed with some of the points we made in that episode. And since, you know, I really respect your opinion a lot, I wanted to have you on and uh, have you have you uh, talk about some of those issues. Um, and one thing I thought you told me that was very interesting is that you said the PLA is a force to be respected and defeated. What did you mean by that? Yeah, I uh, well, first of all, thanks for uh, you know taking up this issue. I mean, uh, the discussion of the capabilities of the the PLA is something that I've spent my most of my adult life looking at, and so I really uh, appreciate your openness to uh, take criticism uh, uh, from me and uh, to specifically answer your question. I think. The answer is they're a force to be reckoned with in terms of the idea that, you know, we just had a, a GAO report out that says that, you know, that, that they're an, essentially an existential threat. We've, we've got lots and lots of evidence that says that the PLA is a force that can be, uh, uh, you know, something that we need to respect and, and worry about in terms of if we had to come up against them. When I say we have to defeat them, that's the way we should approach any adversary any uh, strategic competitor, anybody that talks about the way that the Chinese talk about the United States, if they're presenting a threat to us, then we need to be able to defeat that threat. And so I think one of my, uh, you know, longstanding critiques of the U.S. Uh, defense establishment is, is that we seem to not want to take that on. We're, we're very ready to take it on for Russia and for, uh, you know, North Korea, Iran, other other areas. But when it comes to China, there seems to be this uh, strange, uh, I, strange concept of well, we really can't go after China because they're too big. They're 1.4 billion people, and so and it's very complex, and it's more than just the military. It, it's economic, it's it's diplomacy, it's information warfare, it's all those things. But when it gets down to actual military confrontation, force on force, we seem not not want to address that, and that's been a frustration to me. Do you mean not want to address like we just don't talk about it or are you saying we're not taking it seriously? What's what's the problem? Yeah, we're not. I think some people talk about it. What I find fi funny or not, it's not really funny. What I find equally frustrating is that a lot of the quote unquote China hands, uh, one of the critiques from people like Kevin Rudd and and others are, well, we're always talking about China's military. And when you actually look at the discussions and the dialogue from the China hands community, it's very rarely do you see a national debate about China's military. It's very esoteric. It's very put away into small circles and small cliques of people. And we're really not talking about the, the, the scope and totality of the PLA and what they can bring to bear and what the CCP's uh, strategic, Chinese Communist Party strategic intentions are. And when you put the capabilities and intentions together, you come to this realization that there's something really serious that we should be taking uh, un into account, and but yet we don't show any of that. For instance, while we have a huge defense budget, $750 billion or such uh, every year, uh, we see in this latest defense bill, there's actually a, a decline in the actual numbers of dollars that are going to something like the United States Navy in terms of building a Navy that could be able to uh, fight and defeat a Chinese Navy. So I'm really concerned about the fact that we talk in some circles, again, not the main thrust of the people that talk about China, until recently, till the Trump administration, that's changed somewhat, but still not in the mainstream of the uh, academic community, our think tanks, and, and what we hear in, the, in Capitol Hill and what we hear in the, in the Pentagon. It, it, it's, uh, it's anything but that. And then we don't devote resources to it as if we're taking the threat seriously. 
Well, it seems there is this. There are two weird extremes whenever talking about the Chinese military. It's either that it's just it's just no threat. The U.S. spends so much on its military, complete pushover. Don't even worry about it. Or China has the largest navy in the world. They're 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 incredibly powerful. We have no hope of fighting them. We shouldn't even fight them. Yeah, except I don't hear anybody say that latter part. I haven't heard anybody say that except on you know, talk shows or things like this where somebody asserts that somebody said that. But I have yet to read any U.S. government official documentation that says that China's 10 feet tall, their military, the PLA is 10 feet tall, and it's over, and we might as well give up the, you know, uh, the, the fight for democracy and freedom around the world because China's going to rule the world. I haven't read that anywhere. I haven't seen any politicians say that. Uh, what I see is us not addressing it square on and saying, what do we do in order to deter and then be able to defeat them. We talk about deterrence and defeat, but we don't ever get down into the, what is it that we really need to do? People put out a few things here and there, you know, send a Coast Guard ship out to the Pacific, uh, talk to the, the Pacific Islands, uh, maybe, uh, you know, have P-8s instead of P-3s in the Pacific, put a 2,500 Marines down at Darwin. But there is no kind of holistic, whole of government systemic a- approach to we have to defeat the so or the the Chinese like we t- approached the Soviets. There isn't. We don't do that. And so, I think it's a red herring to say that people are talking about this. We talk about it in this kind of small circle of people, but it's not really a national debate. And I think that's really the issue is we haven't debated it, and we and it's been growing for 25 years. It's not just like it just started yesterday. And so here we are at this point now where. Uh, We're kind of behind in many of the key areas of warfare, and we're getting farther behind because China's outproducing us across the spectrum of of military capabilities. And I I don't see it as people really seeing it and taking it as an existential threat. We just have here in San Diego the U.S. Naval Institute uh, uh, FCA West Conference in San Diego, and you had a a three-star General Heckel who's uh, uh, in charge of the Marine Corps Combat Development Command, and he said... He warned that uh, the U.S. military is developing new weapon systems, but at a much slower pace than China. And he goes, I'm tired of analyzing, he said to the conference. It's paralysis through analysis. We need to stop. Chinese aren't waiting. Xi doesn't go to a board of directors and ask and worry about risk. He says, we are losing time. And that gets to my point. We're running out of time. And so I think it's just it's something that I can't comprehend of why we're not really placing this as the number one threat to the nation and getting after defending our nation and our national security. Well, I mean, Chris, I think I've seen things to your point about, like there was an article in Business Insider um, a while back that was maybe within the last year or so that was something about like, we shouldn't defend Taiwan because we'd get into a nuclear war. Mm-hmm. With China, so th- there's kind of like some of that extreme stuff, but I see what you're saying, Jim. That that is not like ma- in the mainstream kind of U.S. government. Like that is just like somebody kind of writing an opinion article. Well, and Graham Allison has said it. So I mean, there there are some people. I should be fair. There are some people that have talked about this idea that it's either you know appeasement and cooperation or it's thermonuclear war. But my point is, those people that say that are really not the ones that are our political leaders that are running for office that are advertising that. You don't hear congressmen and and, and congresswomen talking like that, maybe a few academics. And so I guess if we want to have that debate, nobody wants to have that politically in Washington. No one is going to run for office to say, I'm the candidate that stands up to say we can surrender to China now because they're bigger than us. Nobody's going to ever do that. So the question then is, if nobody's ever going to say that, are we going to get after figuring out how to confront them and deter them and then defeat them? And we're now, you know, the gun went off and the Chinese are down, you know, it's a hundred yard dash and, you know, they're several yards into the race, maybe 50 yards, 70 yards. I don't know. I mean, I can understand why the political class wouldn't really want to have this debate, right? Like you don't really want to talk about, or U.S. politicians, they don't seem to want to talk about confronting China, a lot of them, or especially confronting China in terms of military Uh, like a possible war, that kind of thing. But do you think this is also something that the U.S. military establishment doesn't really want to talk about? Uh, No, I think inside the military, you know, I'm I'm now retired seven years, but from what I see, there's still a lot of focus on it 
They just released, the White House just released a new Indo-Pacific strategy. Uh, you know, a lot of good words, but they're not being backed up by system. You know, there should be strategy and vision, but then there should be some kind of implementation plan that says, here's what we're doing. And we're going to reorder the Defense Department budget instead of putting equal shares to the Army, to the Air Force and to the Navy. We're going to reorder that so that we put more monies into the services that are going to be bear the brunt of the fight against China, which is clearly a naval and air uh, fight in any Taiwan uh, invasion scenario. Not to say that we don't need an army. I'm just saying that the prioritization and the uh, and the resource allocation have to be altered, but they haven't. In fact, some could argue that because the army has basically had control of the U.S. Defense Department uh, for the last 30 years since Desert Storm, uh, we really haven't had a, a, a military leadership that's been led by a naval perspective like we had in the Cold War when John Lehman was the Secretary of the Navy and we had a president, Ronald Reagan and others, and, and Secretary of Defense, Caspar Weinberger, that focused and understood what they were up against with the Soviet Union and that they had to confront them. Now, in the case of the Soviets, we built up a 600-ship Navy, but we also had 50-plus thousand troops in Germany uh, to cover the fold of gap and make sure that the Russians couldn't, their division, tank divisions, couldn't roll across Europe. So we were capable of fighting in two theaters. And now we're having trouble you know, fighting in any theater, and we're being told that this is just, you know, something that we're, we, we want to go asymmetric, and we don't want to confront in a force-on-force -force, uh, mindset. We, we've been buffaloed into believing uh, that the Chinese military is, is just too big to confront. And I, I'm the last person not to talk about the capabilities of the PLA, but that should not paralyze us into inaction. Well, kind of on this topic, you you mentioned when looking at the PLA, it's a mistake to, you know, think of all of the elements of the PLA as sort of the same thing, that the, you know, the, the, the troops are the same thing as the Navy, which is the same thing as the rocket force. Uh, how should we be, like, what is the difference in capabilities of these different segments of the PLA? Because obviously, as you're saying, even within the U.S. military, there are some pretty big differences. Right. I think there's been a focus from our China hands that they've understood and followed the China's China military going back 30 years since Tiananmen. Those were most of the experts that you, you had on your show uh, uh, referenced. And they constantly talk about the PLA, the PLA, the army, not the whole service, but the People's Liberation Army Army that was Xi kind of broke out in 2015 as he reorganized the PLA writ large. And the you know, their views of the army date back to the Tiananmen era and this idea that they're kind of a, you know, some keystone cops and they don't really have good training. They don't have good material uh, readiness and they're stovepiped and they're not integrated as a joint force. And I think those ideas and, and, and assessments are incorrect, first of all. But second, they don't apply to each service equally. So while the army may be... Uh, the remnants of the army system may still be being transformed in this military modernization effort over the last two and a half decades. The, the places that have really made advances are in areas like the, the strategic rocket force, the PLA Air Force, the PLA Navy, where we see them operating together in joint operations far from home, doing the, you know exercises where they transport troops across the nation into other countries now. We see Y-20 transport aircraft. So they're, they're learning power projection. They're, they're, they're accelerating their learning at a rate that took us decades and decades to learn. And they're learning them in years, in rapid time. And I think, you know, when you see the PLA Navy operate at sea, one of the things that we used to say back in the, you know, when I joined the Navy in 1986, we used to talk about the Soviets and the Soviet Navy would sit at Anchorage in certain parts of the Mediterranean and other parts because they didn't have the fuel, they didn't have the money, they didn't have the operational uh, cost to be able to go out and operate like the U.S. Navy. And we always recognize that even in peacetime when we operated carriers, the carriers that I served on, we were flying and conducting operations as if we were in combat. You know, to launch an, air, launch an aircraft every, you know, 45 seconds and recover it every two minutes, uh, when, you know, depending on when you're launching recovery cycle, that kind of capability to do that is something that you would do in combat. Landing an, a, a jet fighter on an aircraft carrier at night in 
Pichin Seas uh, in the South China Sea in peacetime and wartime are very, very similar. Now, they're different, no question about it, but the core skills of being able to execute and to, and to conduct combat operations in peacetime is what we were doing. We were training to that. So now we see the PLA Navy doing the same thing. They're spending a lot of time at sea. Now, are they as good as us in the same certain areas? No, but they haven't built their Navy to be exactly like ours. That's why their carrier program is behind their submarine program and their surface ship program, because they put a lot of money and effort into this uh, counter intervention or anti-access area denial strategy, which says our main goal is to seize Taiwan and to be able to keep the U.S. military from coming in and supporting Taiwan. So they built a force, a naval force, and a rocket force, and an air force that were designed to do just that. But we're now at this inflection point after 25 years of modernization where their ability to pull off an invasion of Taiwan becomes more likely as each day goes by. It's It, it, it would be uh, naive to think that that force that they're building, especially when they're building Y-20 uh, transport planes and, 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 and new uh, long-range bombers, and hypersonic missiles, and all the other things that they're doing to think that their force is just going to stay confined inside the first island chain. That's naive. We know that they're not going to do that. They've told us that their Belt and Road Initiative is a global initiative, and they're operating forces farther and farther afield than they have, you know, 10 years ago or 15 years ago. And that's only going to increase. So sooner or later, they're going to be on our front doorstep in Hawaii and in San Diego and by all accounts, probably on the East Coast with some of the activities that they're having uh, with Latin American countries and setting up bases on the West Coast of Africa and, and research operations and things that they're doing. So I guess what I'm saying is I'm still banging the drum that the Chinese military is growing and their ability to project power is something that we need to respect. But right now they have the capability to, uh, you know, a lot of people are very afraid that they could take Taiwan. And I think that's something that we need to get down to right now. What are we going to do right now today? Well, that's very interesting because one of the, the common criticisms of uh, the PLA is that they lack fighting experience. The last time they were in a war was in Vietnam, uh, 1979, I believe. So in the event of a Taiwan invasion, could they really do that considering the U.S. military does have decades of active experience? Yeah, we have active experience operating in Afghanistan and in Iraq, uh, but we don't have active experience in the naval arena. So the last time the United States Navy was involved in Marine Corps was involved in amphibious operations uh, was in 1950 in the Korean War. So we haven't operated for 72 years in a, in a maritime invasion scenario like that. Um, we do practice humanitarian assistance, disaster, disaster relief operations, but you just saw here uh, just recently uh, with the uh, volcanic explosion in uh, Tonga, uh, we, we were only able to dispatch a destroyer, and the Chinese right now, as we're talking, have a uh, large deck amphibious uh, helicopter carrier and, uh, and a, a, a resupply ship, two big deck platforms that are out resupplying Tonga. So China's been slowly activating and getting trained in these kind of naval operations for the last two decades. Um, and so I think we discount that. We we talk about, I saw it also at, at this AFSIA conference, apparently a retired four-star made some comment about they don't have any experience, they may be a little skirmish on the Indian border. Uh, but what we discount is the fact that the Chinese military has been operating inside their country doing m huge force movements and uh, movement of, you know, like we just saw today, main battle tanks from the Nanjing military region, which is on the east coast of, of Shanghai, and moving them out into the Gobi Desert, hundreds of tanks to do a, an exercise out there, or moving, you know, airborne corps troops around the country, or fortifying the Indian border. Uh, and, and as I said, they're starting to push out into, into uh, Af uh, Afghanistan, maybe, and into Pakistan and other areas. So, I think what we're seeing is this this idea that we are outmoded thinking that says that they're really the the PLA of the 1990s or 2000s, early 2000s, and we're not giving them the kind of credit that they deserve for what they've done over the last two, two and a half decades. And 
that's that's where my big trouble is with it. We we kind of say they don't have experience, but we have experience. Well, we had experience in, you know, conducting a, a an airlift out of Afghanistan, and we took hundred thousand, hundred twenty five thousand people out. Well, that's not combat. That's a retreat. Okay. So that doesn't that there is some experience there. Fly aircraft in and put a bunch of people on them, but that's not combat experience, and it's certainly no equivalent to what would occur to defend Taiwan. I mean, when I saw that four star use as an example to say and proudly boast, yeah, we're the U.S. military. We're so strong. We were able to airlift 125,000 people out of Kabul. I'm thinking that well, if I'm in Taiwan, are you telling me that that's what you're going to do? You're going to airlift out hundreds of thousands of Americans, and and that's your that's your military plan. I mean, we need to have something much different. We need to have a a strategy and a plan and the capabilities to be able to say, if China tries to take Taiwan, we're going to break their fingers off and and, and break their knuckles. And we don't have anybody speaking like that. Well, so that's very very interesting because as you're from what you're saying, like the U.S. Navy's uh, main experience is not. You know, it hasn't been like combat experience really since World War II. Most of the U.S. Navy's experience comes through these regular training exercises on sea because combat on sea is very similar to just act, uh, being active on the sea. And that sounds pretty similar to China's Navy at this point. So really from what, how you're framing it, the U.S. Navy and the PLA Navy are kind of on the same level of experience. I think it, it depends. If you talk about carrier airborne operations, no, they're, we're way ahead of them. We have we still operate our carriers at sea, and we have many more jet aircraft on our aircraft carriers, and we can do a lot more, and we're much more effective. But when you're operating your carrier under the envelope of a DF-21D or a DF-26 anti-carrier ballistic missile, that's a different story when combined with Chinese submarines and surface ships that have long range anti-ship cruise missiles that are coming in like this from all different directions, while you're worrying about also airborne, you know, launched anti-ship cruise missiles coming in from the PLA Air Force. And all at once you're being attacked from a missile system that you never worried about. You know, we fought in, in, in off of Afghanistan in 2003, 2004, 2005, Operation Enduring Freedom, our carriers, four or five carriers set off of the coast of Afghanistan, and you know, people were eating ham sandwiches and reading magazines figuratively while their pilots were launching and going and dropping bombs in Afghanistan. We kind of did the same thing in Desert Storm in Iraq in 1991. So we've never been in an environment where our aircraft carriers are having to operate while they're being attacked by a peer competitor. Let's see how we do when all of a sudden our air operations have to fight with a contingency of a, a truckload of anti-ship cruise missiles, hypersonic missiles, anti-carrier ballistic missiles, and finding, you know, if you're on an aircraft carrier, you have to find out where are all the enemy submarines, where are all the enemy surface ships, where are all the enemy aircraft, and oh, by the way, where are these ballistic missiles that are coming in? And you got to find and figure out all those while you're also concurrently figuring out how do I get off this carrier, how do I get to a tanker, and then how do I get to what target am I going to attack? Because are we going to attack the Chinese mainland or are we going to attack their ships? We spent the last 30 years figuring out how to target and, and fight fixed targets and land. Some mobile targets, high value individual terrorists and, 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 uh, you know, and trucks and things of that nature. But a lot of that was done with intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance assets that were orbiting over you know, town X in Iraq or Afghanistan, where you had precise intelligence and said, there is that precise bad guy, and I'm going to zap him because I know exactly where he is. Whereas in you're in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, you're like, where are their ships? Where are their submarines? And how am I going to get lead on them to sink them? So one of the discussions that's never really discussed in, in the defense circles and the China hand circles is the vast difference between the last 30 years of war of war over land and war in the desert versus war at sea. And when I joined the U.S. Navy, the U.S. Navy was a war at sea Navy. We were we were 100 percent focused on fighting the Soviet Navy globally around the world. And that focus has changed in 30 years. And we are not getting it back and not quick enough. 
Certain people get it. No, don't get me wrong. It's changing, but it's not changing enough. It's not changing rapidly because we don't have uh, the kind of intellectual capacity and the, the political leaders that we have that really are preaching this. We don't have a president uh, or a secretary of defense that's come in and said, we have to do this and here's what we're going to do to get back to being a naval uh, power and a maritime nation that can control the seas. And this idea that you can take the force that's been built to fight in Afghanistan and Iraq and just transfer it to the Taiwan scenario or the Senkaku scenario or the South China Sea scenario, that's, a, that's just not going to happen. If they're not the same. And people do not talk about that. So when I hear analysts say, well, they're inexperienced and, and they're not, they don't know what to do, well, that may be in a ground war against Vietnam or a ground war against India, but it's not the same, as you said, in a naval conflict over Taiwan. At that point, we're at parity now because nobody in the U.S. Navy that's serving today served in those times. Now, there's maybe one or two guys, but it's not driving the Defense Department's budgeting resources, the, the allocation of, of people and prioritization, the promotions of people, uh, the, the innovation and which technologies that we need. China's got this whole system of missiles that they've deployed on their naval ships and submarines and aircraft specifically designed and built to sink the U.S. Pacific Fleet. We are still thinking and transitioning from dropping bombs in the desert to how do we find and sink Chinese ships and submarines and aircraft at sea? And people are working on that, but it's on the fringes of the Defense Department. It's in small science projects and things of that nature. And, and, and it's not really a holistic, wholesale, this is a new threat, Stop everything we've been doing and get on this. So how dangerous are China's aircraft carrier killer missiles? And like, how are they different from what there was, you know, during the Korean War, during other wars? Well, in the Korean War, they didn't have these missiles. They would have, you know, patrol boats or they'd have a, you know, some aircraft come out and drop a single small bomb. I mean, these ballistic missiles are designed to find big metal at sea, big aircraft carriers, a thousand foot long piece of flight deck, and to find it, either tracking its radar before it launches, and then after it launches while it's up in space and comes down in the atmosphere, it can reacquire if it's moved, and then zero in on it, going at you know five times the speed of sound, maneuvering, and then hit the target. Now, People say, well, they've never done it in real life. They said that for many, many years. But then in August of 2020, we saw the Chinese shoot a salvo of anti-ship ballistic missiles uh, into the South China Sea closure area. And from all the reports that I've read, it said that they were they were at a maneuvering, moving target in that closure area. Uh, I, could, I, I can't go into other details, but I'm confident that the Chinese anti-carrier ballistic missile force of the DF-21D and the DF-26 when shot in large numbers, not just one at a time, but when you shoot 100 of them, it dramatically increases your capability and probability of hitting an aircraft carrier. And when it hits one, it's something that we haven't had since World War II. And we're not, we're not prepared for that. We have, we have damage control on our ships and we have things of that nature. But psychologically, we're not prepared for the first time a U.S. aircraft carrier takes a, takes a ballistic missile and it blows up on an aircraft carrier. So how can the U.S. Navy defend against this or prepare to defend against it? Well, we have been preparing this. I don't want to, again, get over my skis here. Uh, there's been work going on since before I retired that figures out how to defeat that missile by deceiving it. And I'll just leave it at that. And so there's, 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 there's technologies and there's work that's going on. They call it left of kill chain. So before the missile is fired, can you can you tell? Can you deceive them on where you're at? So all kinds of things are been put into place to try to defeat the missile. Uh, and there's ballistic missile defense systems like the FAD, Theater High Area Air Defense System, or the Patriot. Uh, but again, Patriots and FADs are not of any use in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, right? There's not going to be a FAD battery steaming alongside an aircraft carrier, at least not yet. So this. It's a very difficult problem, and it causes us to think in different ways than just using aircraft carriers, which is what our pre predominant, not exclusive, but one of our biggest threat vectors 
to the Chinese as the aircraft carrier. We have submarines, we have surface ships, we have other things that we need to start getting after. And there are people that have proposed this. I don't want to say that no one has done it. There's a, a lot of good proposals out there. During the Trump administration, there was a proposal for a 500 ship Navy where a, a large percentage of that was unmanned uh, surface vehicles and undersea vehicles that could, you know, be deployed out in kind of a uh, in packs of, of ships that could, you know, be uh, driven by other sensors that could get it to the threat area, get it to the Chinese Navy and, you know, expend weapon systems. But again, it's not from a national perspective. It's not something that we hear our politicians talk about. It's not something we even hear the Defense Department really hammer every day. And so that's the, the real issue I have. And then, like I said, I don't think the academic community is clearly there at all. No one's talking about this aspect of it. It's like everybody in the PLA is equal. If you're a soldier with a rifle or you're on an aircraft carrier or you're in a submarine or you're a strategic rocket force person or in the Air Force, they're treated almost as if they're all the same, and they're not. The discussion on the PLA Navy has always struck me as being very strange. Like, transparently, the Chinese Communist Party has been designing uh, capabilities specifically targeted at destroying America's Navy. Like, that was that that was obvious to even us, like, years and years ago. Um, but yet, it was, like, we. it seemed like as a nation, we never really, like, took it seriously that, like, hey, China is transparently trying to destroy, making a system to destroy our Navy. And there, were, and there was never really any of a, a response to that, even as, you know, they ended up having the biggest Navy in the world. It just seemed like there was not ever anything that was talked about. No one seemed to want to prepare for it or treat China as a threat, even though clearly they were working at undermining the United States military. Right. I, I agree with that. I mean, it's, and if you think about, it, you have people inside the U S Navy, you have admirals, scores and scores of admirals and scores and scores of senior executive service, SESs, all people that are making quite handsome sums of, of, of salaries. And you'd think that somewhere along the line, at least the people inside the Navy would stand up and say, hey, uh, we got to do something a little bit different here because uh, we're going to get smoked by these guys if we don't get back to, you know, prioritizing resources and, and, and strategies towards naval warfare. Uh, but that's never really happened. Instead, what happened over the last 30 years is you had unfortunately admirals and, and, and SESs that basically said, well, we have to follow whatever is the, the, you know, and you, you want that, you don't want people to be rogue, but it's just been this, you know, kind of, well, we're in the war in the desert, we're in the war against terror. And so that's the most important thing that we need to focus on. And I'm not going to be the leader of the Navy at this time. That's going to buck that system and try to do something different. The air force had a couple of people that did that and they got fired by secretary of defense Gates. He said, I don't want to hear anything. that's not going to help me fight today's war when you come and tell me about something that's going to be in 20 years from now. I only want to hear about today's war. Well, that's not really the purpose of the leadership of the Pentagon. The purpose of the leadership of the Pentagon is to look down the road and say, what's coming? And let's make sure as a nation that we never get it put in a position where it, we're at a disadvantage. And so no matter what anybody wants to say, and they get very upset when I say this, the fact of the matter is we're sitting here in 2022 with a PLA Navy that's larger than the United States Navy, and not one Navy admiral, not, not one senior executive service person has been fired or held to account for how we got to this point. We just were the frog in the pot, and we've been boiling one degree at a time, increasing one degree at a time over 30 years. And now we're, now we're like, okay, we don't want to talk about it. Oh, I was going to ask, because you were talking about how China's developed a different type of Navy than us. Is part of this just kind of looking at China and measuring them against our Navy? Because when you say, you know, the China's Navy is bigger than ours now, I've seen a lot of people dismiss that as well. Like, they're small ships. You know, we still have the most aircraft carriers, et cetera. Right. Well, over the last decade, China's outproduced us in tonnage. So, I mean, they're, they're actually, if we project that out another 10 years, 
who's to say who's actually got more ships, not holes of ships, but larger size ships. If you look at just last year in 2021, China commissioned 22 warships. They were big, big 10,000 to 15,000 ton uh, destroyers and cruisers. United States commissioned three ships, two of which were small LCS class and one submarine, I think. So we're on a trajectory where they're growing bigger and better in every metric and we're not. And so, yes, we were an, a carrier Navy and our carrier Navy's done great things. And I spent 20 years of my life on carrier. So I, I, I respect everything that we've done and continue to do today. But the fact of the matter is, if we were to try to defend Taiwan in the naval arena, we're going to have a hell of a time defending them because China has a Navy that can get in, drop off troops, and keep ours at bay. And that's today. Where will they be when they say they want to be the world's you know, number one superpower in 2045, 2049? And what kind of Navy will it have then? And if they continue on this trajectory, they're going to have a Navy that's going to be essentially the U.S. Navy, where they're operating globally with aircraft carriers and expeditionary strike groups. And uh, we just don't seem to be uh, aware of that. And, and it's not driving us. And we don't see the linkage between what that means and what it what it, the impact is on our life as, as Americans. We should see it now after two years of COVID when you see 100 ships off the port of Long Beach. You should understand the impact that maritime trade has on a nation and why it's so important to be able to have a strong Navy. We recognize that early on as a nation. Uh, our founding fathers were pretty smart about that. They were forced into it by the British. The British learned that throughout their history. So a strong Navy means a strong nation, and Xi has recognized that. I think Hu Jintao and Xi Jinping also recognize it, but Xi's the one that's really kind of, if you want to say, you know, wrapped it up in a, and put a bow in it and really elevated the PLA Navy and maritime issues. You know, it makes me think of uh, a recent episode we did on our other show, America Uncovered, about the latest... U.S. aircraft carrier that has that was kind of a disaster. Just well, like, I, mean, I don't know if it was a disaster, but there were these elevators that were like missile elevators, right? Yeah, and it was just like really over budget and took a long longer to get that technology in place than they said it was going to. Right, that's the USS Ford, and it and it's had a lot of problems. And this is, I mean, I don't want to be critical of people that have built this. But the fact of the matter is we're having tough times developing warships and getting them to sea to be operational. I, some people are critical of that criticism and saying, well, that's not fair. We've always had this history of, of development with the, the Navy, and it takes time to work out the kinks. And there's some truth to that. But the fact of the matter remains, we've had, you know, it's kind of like the baseball thing. You get three strikes and you're out. We've ha kind of had three strikes, the Ford class uh, aircraft carrier, the LCS, littoral combat ship. And then the Zomwalt class cruiser that has no weapon that can shoot anything, even though it costs like a billion dollars a pop. So those are three ships over the last 20 years that or more that we've tried to field and they've kind of been flat. They have been unsuccessful in many ways. While on the other hand, we talk about the PLA Navy and what they've done. You know, this is the this is the concern is that as a nation. We haven't developed our shipyards. We haven't built up that shipbuilding capability to be able to compete with China. We, even if we, even if Congress came in and said, we're going to give you $800 billion in 2022 to build a 600-ship Navy, it can't be done. We physically can't do it. So there's got to be other things that we can do. And I think that's maybe the frustration I have in my mind is we're stuck in a place where we have to do asymmetric kinds of, air, you know, nibbling on the edges. But that still doesn't mean that we don't stand up and say we need to build a big Navy and that needs to be a Navy that can compete and defeat the PLA Navy. Uh, I think we need to do both. Now, uh, outside of an actual war with China over Taiwan, you know, and you kind of hinted at this, but maybe it's better to spell it out a bit. Like, why should Americans care if China has a big Navy that's bigger than the US Navy, it's not like if, if they're not gonna go to war with us over Taiwan, then what does it matter? 
Well, they, first of all, I think they will go to war over Taiwan if Taiwan doesn't knuckle under in, uh, by 2030. Um, and secondly, once China has that kind of capability to control the oceans and, and, and to say who can pass and who can go, uh, look what China did with Australia this last couple of years, year and a half or so. You know, uh, Scott Morrison, the prime minister, asked a question in the UN and said, hey, uh, can we ask how this thing started with the virus? And China came down on Australia like a ton of bricks and said, we're not going to buy anything from you. We're going to put an economic embargo on you, a blockade, essentially. They didn't have to do it with their Navy, but they were able to successfully not buy things from Australia. Now, the Australians were clever enough and they figured out other markets to sell. Well, what happens when you have a Navy that can stop the Australians from selling their ore and their lobsters and their wine and their wool and other things to other nations? What happens if Chinese warships interdict Australian commercial vessels and prevent them from exporting their raw goods. The same thing can be done to the United States or to Europe or, or to Latin America or other parts of Asia. That's the real concern because we know that China, the Chinese Communist Party is no respecter of rule of law. They talk about that, but we know they're not. So when they have the power, what's the, there's an old song from the 70s called, you know, what are you going to do when the, the rabbit's got the gun? You know, when they have the gun, when they have the capability, What's what are they going to do with it? And we, you know, some people say, oh, well, they'll 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 not they'll be benign because they don't want to disrupt global trade. Maybe. But we also know that when they don't get what they want or somebody stands in defiance to them and asks a simple question, the communist you know, ideology is to take a sledgehammer out and bash them over the head. And we know that the Chinese have talked about, you know, they set up that uh, air defense identification zone in the East China Sea back in 2014 as a way of, they didn't really comprehend what an aid is, was for, but the idea that they did it for was to say, well, we can control who flies in our air defense identification zone. So they have this tendency already to say, we'll control who can go where and when. We've seen some reports that say, even in the South China Sea, that there's plans to set up corridors. They've talked about it. Well, you know, we'll have a corridor here and you, you'll transit via this corridor through the South China Sea. And if you deviate from your track, you know, we're, we're going to smack you around, maybe. Didn't they pass a law or something saying that, you know, ships have to identify themselves to the Chinese Navy? Yeah, they did. They, that's a great point. They've already come out and said in naval matters, their interpretation of the United Nations Convention Law of the Sea says that any other foreign navy must check in with the Chinese and identify themselves and where they're going and where they came from, et cetera. And nobody's paying attention to that right now. But since October of 2015, the Chinese Navy has shadowed every foreign warship that's gone into the South China Sea, not just American Navy, every other nation that's gone in there. So who's to say once they dominate in the naval arena that they're not going to extend that to commercial shipping? And once they do that, once they start taking control of the market like that, that will have a direct impact on Americans' lives. Whether you're a business owner or an investor, or you're just somebody that wants to go, you know, get what you normally get, whether it's food or clothes or tools or whatever it is, they will control that system and that'll control your life. You know, I think a lot of Americans don't even realize how the Chinese Communist Party essentially blockaded medical supplies from the United States in the early days of the pandemic let alone have this concept that in the future, China could be capable of blockading global supply chains, of effectively being an authoritarian power capable of sanctioning any country they want. Uh, what, what, what do you think is, is it going to take to get the American public aware of this threat? Well, I think, you know, we, we've been two years into this kind of people asserting powers for an emergency. And we're starting to see around the world, people wake up and say, hold on a minute, the emergency, emergency is like for like six months. We're now two and a half years into this. Why, why are we still saying emergency? Why are you still, you know, say playing Simon Says with me? Simon says, wear a mask. Simon says, don't wear a mask. Simon says, stand on your foot. People are starting to wake up about that in, in a larger sense, uh, but they haven't really identified and linked it exclusively, or not exclusively, but to the real serious one, which is from China, because China will have, as I keep saying, the gun. They'll have the military power to enforce whatever they dictate. They'll have the economic cloud as well. They'll use 
comprehensive national power to get what they want. They, they didn't want to launch a war against Australia this last two years. But if it got down to it, they would do that. You've had people, in Chinese uh, acolytes and, and advisors and like Victor Gao say, hey, now that Australia has signed into the AUKUS submarine deal, the Australia-UK-US submarine deal, you've now put yourself on the nuclear targeting list of the PLA. That's pretty provocative. You know, I do think that is one area where it's kind of breaking through the general malaise of American society. Like, you know, uh, people were a little worried about like, oh, China has a bigger Navy, but uh, you can dismiss that, whatever. But uh, there's still like this big fear of nuclear war. And I think people were kind of beginning to pay attention when it's like, oh, wait, China just built like over 100 nuclear missile silos in Xinjiang. And then like a month later, like, oh, here's 100 more. And I think there is like, like almost like people can kind of understand like, oh, wait, they're building nuclear weapons. The PLA rocket force might be, maybe, maybe this is a threat. Yeah. I mean, I mean, we've, we've never been at nuclear war. Like the U.S. has dropped two bombs in, you know, 70 years ago, but we, we've never been in an actual nuclear war where, where opponents were using them against each other. Like, how does that even how does it even happen? You know, what triggers that? Well, we don't want to trigger that. We want to deter that. And you have to deter it across not just nuclear weapons and nuclear arsenal, but you have to have the conventional piece as well. If, if they're linked together, they're not separate. And we understood that in the Cold War with the Soviets. And so we always maintained that advantage. I'm sitting here in a house, it's like 100 years old, and in the basement, there's a, you know, there's a nuclear shelter, bomb shelter. All the houses in Switzerland have them. You know, Americans in the in the 1950s and early 60s, when you went to school, you crawled under your desk when the, the air raid sirens came out because you were preparing for how you, you know, survive a nuclear attack. So it's something that we've lived under. It's not something that's fun and convenient to talk about, but it's the ostrich strategy doesn't work either. I mean, and so I think Chris is right. I mean, I'm starting to hear some of it, but we have, we've built in this kind of, with this engager school, the engagement school, we've built in this almost a psychosis, which says we really never can fully say China's a threat. We're, we're never really going to say it, even though there's 350 of these ICBM silos out now in central China that have been built in the last six, seven months. Uh, we're still, I mean, to me, the, when I saw those images that you, you've all seen over the last uh, half year, nine months, whatever exact time frame it is. When I saw those, it was a, it was, it was chilling to me because it really meant that we had been so asleep uh, that we, that we just dismissed back in 2012 warnings from people, you know, that had been in the Reagan era, our, our, our seniors, people that had fought the Cold War, and we had ignored their warnings from a decade ago to say, hey, China's going to build a nuclear arsenal. It was scoffed at. It was literally scoffed at by the U.S. intelligence community. They said, nah, that's nothing to worry about. That's being hype. That guy's a wacko. And now here we are with, you know, right in our face. I mean, you say we we, we can't even call China a threat. There are, there are still people who just refuse to except that this is another Cold War. We can't even call it a Cold War, let alone a threat. Well, I mean, I feel like a Cold War sounds worse than a threat. Is it? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, if you're in a Cold War, this is like, now you're in a great power competition. That's mm -hmm. much more serious than just saying, well, they might be a threat to us. I guess. Yeah, but I feel like, you know, to your point, Jim, like the the Chinese Communist Party has been saying and acting like they're bullying countries, they're really being more and more aggressive, but then it's almost like we are the ones that are trying to make excuses for that. Like they are showing us what they're doing and they're being more and more aggressive, but then you have what you call the engager school of people who are kind of all just like, oh, well, it's not that big of a deal or they're just being a bully. Like they're just, it's just like a words or whatever, like this whole wolf warrior diplomacy idea is like they're just coming out and being more aggressive diplomatically. Yeah, I think I, I agree with all that. And I, I the, the, you know, the China hands that I talk to, and I try to talk to as many as I can. I mean, they'll say that, 
you know, this is G. This is G. If, if we didn't have G, uh, the, the party would probably go back to the way it was under Hu Jintao. We'd have more liberalization and opening up. And it's only because of G. And if you challenge that and say, well, no, actually, you know, you can go back and look at all their leaders and look at the party. This is a this is the pathway. This is the ideology. This is the trajectory that the party's on. Then they'll say, well, you're 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 de- you're a determinist. And so you're a determinist. You've decided that they're going to be an enemy and there's nothing that will change your mind on that. And I'd say, hey, I, I'll change my mind when you show me that they're not threatening me, you know, when they're not talking about you know, launching nuclear missiles at my allies in Australia or Japan or the things that they say in Global Times all the time or the military that they're building or those ICBM silos. So uh, I think we're past the point of saying this is just normal buildup for a big country. What we're seeing on display in the Olympics, uh, you know, it's it's this is about China taking the world stage as the sole global superpower. And that's not going to be fun for everybody. Well, this is one of the strengths of the China's military that doesn't really get talked about so much. But the idea of like their political subversion, how they've been able to bend, uh, you know, American politicians or analysts or think tank people to have this sort of you know, engagement viewpoint towards dealing with China, which really gives the Chinese regime lots of cover to be able to develop its military. That's it's, that's exactly what's happened over the last 30 years. They've been able to operate under this kind of cover of, well, they're developing, they're, you know, we need to engage with them so they can become like us. And they were able to race ahead and and do the things that, you know, take an obsolete military that they basically had in the late 90s and transform it into a military force that's capable of fight across all spectrums right now. Maybe they're not able to launch a uh, an invasion of Afghanistan from like we did from America into Afghanistan or something. But that's not they don't need to be there right now. What they need to do right now is what they've been doing in terms of I need to be able to take Taiwan. I need to be able to take the Senkakus and the South China Sea, which I think they have essentially. And I need to be able to take out some territory with India and then expand my network and influence through things like the Belt and Road, uh, One Belt, One Road. And, you know, the what we're seeing and things like how they're how are they able to be able to get the, the Beijing Olympics? I mean, there's no snow there. It's not an alpine region. But yet the uh, International Olympic Committee was happy to to award them those Beijing Olympics. Was it because Beijing and the Communist Party wanted to have the spectacle of being the only country in history of the Olympics that had both winter and summer games? Maybe. What what's going on? With, and, and you know the influence that China has in the United Nations. What does it have in the the World Bank and in these areas where they're able to, you know, influence things for their way and you know, some people say, well, you're just sour grapes because you're an American and you don't want to lose your power. And I'd say, yeah, that's right. I am. I'm an American and I feel pretty good about what we've done as a nation in terms of world history and the things that we've done and the principles that we stand for. China doesn't stand for the same principles that we do. And so I guess that would get to one of the last points that we discussed on, online before, which is, you know, we talked about this comparison between the militaries, motivation. When I look and see and hear everything that comes out of China, they seem to be motivated up and down the spectrum. Uh, When I see, you know, their their videos, sure, their videos are propaganda. But when we look at their forces and we look at what people are saying, it seems like the PLA and its members are highly motivated. uh, And the party, 95 million of them, are motivated to achieve their strategic goals. They've got a focus. They've got a purpose. And they're motivated. And when I look at my own, our own country, I'm sometimes wondering, we don't have a purpose, We're as we just debated the last hour. Are we a maritime nation? Are we a land power? Do we even understand the implications of being a maritime power on our, our daily lives, our national security? And then are we focused on that? Or are we focused on other things that this new administration has brought out in the first year uh, for the Department of Defense, looking for domestic terrorists or promoting, you know, non war fighting uh, issues. I mean, it almost seems linked in a certain way that, like Jim, to have a purpose for a military 
there almost has to be a th- like some kind of threat that you're watching out for, right? Or not even just a threat, but a, a national identity. Well, I was just thinking part of the whole thing about like the, yeah, like China is use, using nationalism a, ra- a lot right now. But if we don't admit that the Chinese Communist Party is a threat, then we don't need to confront it. Then there's not really a purpose to ha- like, why do we need to be a maritime power if there's not going to be another nation that's going to control the seas? Like if it is, you know, the kind of 90s uh, end of history type of thing where like everybody's going to be like, a, you know, a liberal, like democratic nation, that's what's going to happen. Then, you know, maybe you don't need a, you don't need superpowers anymore, but you have to only want to look at the world through a particular lens and not through what's happening right now. I think that's my biggest concern, Shelley, is that we're being defeated from the inside in terms of ideology. Huntington talked about the class of civilizations, and that was a motivator for what we did, rightly or wrongly, maybe you could say in the desert over the last 30 years in some ways. We had the Soviets, but it was still a clash of ideologies, maybe not civilizations, but ideologies, and the the differences were stark. But today in the United States, we have polls that say that, you know, large numbers of our our society think that socialism maybe isn't that bad, and maybe communism should be thought about. And so what used to be our civilization is, is eroding into something that, you know, is more akin to what the, the Chinese Communist Party wants to do that, and subvert us. And so they're defeating us that way and they're they're demotivating us. So when I talk about motivation, I'm not to, I'm not here to say that my, the, the US Navy sailors and Marines that are serving and Army and Air Force that are serving today are not motivated. Uh, but I would when I go up and ask them, and I did that when I was on active duty seven years, more than seven years ago, I would ask my sailors what did you do today to defeat the Chinese? Not in a physical sense, but what did you do to defend America? What did you do? And a lot of times people would be like, well, I don't know. What am I? I'm just here. I'm just, you know, it's almost like being in the military today is like working at Xerox, which is nothing wrong with working at Xerox. I could pick another company, but the point is working at Xerox isn't the same as working in a place where you're going to give your life from your fellow citizens where you put on a uniform and you say, I'm going to sub, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to put aside my personal interest for the, for the, the team, the U S military team, I'm going to wear my uniform and I'm going to serve proudly. And I'm not going to be, uh, you know, uh, uh, thin skinned about certain things that are being discussed in social circles in the media. And I'm here to fight and win against whoever they tell me to go fight and win against. And it helps if you know who you're fighting and going against. When I, like, like I said, when I came in, it was clear it was the Soviet Union and there was no, no debate about it. There was no partisanship to it. There wasn't Democrats versus Republicans. If you were in the U.S. military, you knew what the enemy was. And it didn't matter if you were in the Navy, the Army, the Air Force, you knew. And it didn't matter if you were a civilian working in the Pentagon. Everything was about defending America against the Soviets. And that meant fighting the Soviets in the worst case. And we don't have that, as you say, we don't have that today. And it's even being further eroded by all this other non-war fighting discussions that we'll have in our society. I don't want to go into the whole list because that just it's just too provocative. But you know what I'm talking about. Everybody knows what we're talking about. We're doing everything except talking about how, are, how am I going to kill the Chinese? And I don't want to kill one Chinese person. But if that's my job, then I have to talk about it. I have to think about it. I have to chew on it. I have to spend every waking hour thinking about and building up the capacity to defeat and and kill the Chinese military. That's the job. And if we don't have that in our military today, we're not going to be successful. And people have to talk like that. And and, And they'll call you a warmonger. They'll call you crazy. They'll call you all those things. But we did that for over 40 years with the Soviets, and we never had a war. Because the Soviet Union understood and respected power, as, as Ronald Reagan said, peace through strength. So nobody wants to go to war, but we're all prepared to go to do it. At least we were. And I hope that we still will be for, for as long as we're a nation. 
Do you think that there is, like, what would it take to turn around, like, to turn the discussion, to turn around where we are now to where we need to be? Well, typically what's happened in our history is it's taken some cataclysmic event like a 9-11 or December 7th. Uh, I don't want to see that, <laughs> but that's been our history. But the, now the, the difference is maybe it's different. I don't know. I mean, I talked to people that were alive that served in World War II that I knew growing up and while I was in the Navy still. Uh, and things are in some ways bad, but even before World War II, we were preparing, not like we should have been, but there were people that were preparing. And I think the same is happening today in certain circles in, in the Defense Department. Uh, people are trying to prepare under the auspices and the environment that we're working under. Uh, but, we, but we should be intelligent enough to say we don't have to have another 9-11 or a 7 December to go through this. That's the goal. That should be our goal. But it seems like humans, uh, uh, we, we, we're not wired that way. We're not really, a, as Americans especially, we're not a belligerent nation. We, we, we react when we're struck, uh, but not, we don't really seek out to go do these things. So uh, one of the uh, threats, potentially a distracting threat on the near horizon is Russia and their um, troop buildup on the Ukrainian border. How does that affect the U.S. military's priority with respect to China? Well, I, I know there's a lot of good folks out there that have cautioned about, you know, putting too much emphasis on on Russia. Um, and my 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 feeling is, if we don't show a hard line to Putin in Russia and on the Ukrainian situation, if we don't, uh, de, you know, show some deterrence there, that's going to be interpreted by Xi and the Communist Party, and it'll be measured in their scientific development as they go through and they rack and stack. American capabilities, American intentions. Uh, oh, okay, so they didn't react here. We saw what they did in Kabul. Now let's see what they do in Ukraine. Okay, maybe it's time to go to Taiwan because we have this you know, data that we've been able to register. Here's what the Secretary of State said. Here's what the Secretary of Defense said. Here's what the Vice President said in, at the Munich conference coming up. They'll, they'll digest all this stuff and they'll feed it into their what they call comprehensive national power and scientific development, and they'll figure out whether or not it's a right time to invade Taiwan or not. Uh, it'll be a factor. So that's that's pretty obvious. But on the other hand, they'll also factor in what are we doing militarily? What are our, what are our militaries doing? What is the NATO military doing? And how could that be used against them or not used against them? Or how does the United States respond to to if Putin moves, you know, some some division here, or some battalion there, do we respond to that? We won't see that in the press, but they'll see that in through other sources, and that'll go into their calculations as well. Well, I think it's interesting. You're you're kind of mentioning like the 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 the, the focus of the U.S. as in terms of war fighting capabilities. Because one of the another one of the common uh, criticisms of the Chinese military is uh, low morale. People sometimes say, you know, the one child policy also cripples their military. Uh, how, well, what, what do you think about that? Is that accurate? Is low morale and the one child policy uh, making the Chinese military not a threat? How much of an impact does that actually have? I, I, you, you hear this argument, uh, and we heard it after the, the big earthquake, I think, in 2008, where family members were upset that the government hadn't done more to protect their children at the schools with the proper construction and things of that nature. So, yes, having a one-child society makes people hypersensitive to the safety of their one child. But as we also have seen, and it was in your show, it talked about the fact that you know they recruit and do annual recruiting drives and they bring in conscripts twice a year, they bring in 400,000 people. Uh, so we don't, we don't hear or see the impact of people being so disgruntled that they can't uh, volunteer to serve in the military. Sure, in the elite circles of, the, of Chinese society or PRC society, there are certainly people that would look down upon a career in the military, just like in America. Nobody at Harvard or or the Ivy League would want to serve in the military. That's looked down and frowned upon as you know being below the elite status. 
But for the rank and file of Chinese, maybe if you're from the central China or eastern China or western China, you're going to have uh, an opportunity to get out of the muck and mire of where you're at or uh, some dead end, you know, job that's, uh, you know, what was that, 996, where you're working 12 hours a day, six days a week uh, in, you know, putting together toys for, you know, America or Europe. So you're like, no, I think I'll go volunteer to go be in the military. So I think I, I don't see that. I don't see it. Maybe it's there psychologically, social, uh, societally, but I don't see it in in the recruiting numbers. I don't see it in the the operations. I don't see it in the the, the any other sources that suggest that people are dissatisfied with being in the military. Now, on the other hand, if there are, there probably is some sporadic evidence of that, and you know, people complain. In every military, we used to have a saying in the Navy, and I'm going to get in trouble for saying this, but it used to say, a bitching sailor is a happy sailor. So if you're whining and complaining about being in the service, that's just kind of par for the course. But I don't even see that from the Chinese. Now, they suppress kind of dissent and things of that nature. But in terms of numbers and what we see their operations, I don't see an impact from it, at least not in the PLA Navy uh, and the PLA Air Force. And I, I frankly, I don't see it in the PLA Army either. Well, Jim, thanks so much for joining us today and, 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 you know, sharing these thoughts that really are not out there nearly enough about the threat of the Chinese Communist Party and the military in particular. Well, thanks so much for the opportunity. I mean, they're not 10 feet tall. I mean, I'm not saying that I'm not a defeatist. What I'm saying is that I'm, a, I think, a realist, which is to say they're a serious threat and we need to take that seriously and we need to start defending ourselves. And that means taking the, the force head on and to recognize that at least for the near term, naval warfare is very important for our nation. And we need to get back to being a naval power and being able to blunt the Taiwan invasion. And if we were able to do that, imagine the impact that would have on the on, on Xi and the party if they had their hands blunted. You know, if they try to creep into Taiwan and we broke their fingers, that would have a dramatic impact on the regime survivability. So it's more than just a force on force thing, which it really is most important, but that that piece of it would really have a strategic impact. Amen to that. Thanks again, John. <laughs> <laughs> Amen to that. Thank, thanks for joining us. All right. Thank you all. Have a good night. You know, I was thinking about what Jim was saying about how historically it's taken some disaster like 9-11 or the Pearl Harbor attack to kind of snap America into like, oh, wait, this is a threat. Yeah. Churchill said, uh, you know, America is a country that will always do the right thing after exhausting every other option. Uh, well, I was thinking that COVID could have been that threat. But it wasn't. But it wasn't. And it wasn't because we were complicit in that. Do you know what I mean? Like the a, ge a genius thing that the Chinese Communist Party has done is by getting U.S. businesses and institutions and, uh, you know, officials and, you know, academics involved in a lot of different aspects of what they're doing is that, for example, when people started talking about how a lab leak could have caused the virus, the coronavirus to spread, then... Uh, you had these scientists who came out and were like, no, 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 that's a conspiracy theory. Mm -hmm. That is, you know, um, impugning the good name of Chinese scientists. We can't let that stand. And then they basically started to use the media to squash it. And that is because they were involved, right? Peter Daszak from the Eco Health Alliance, he was involved. A lot of research, uh, a lot of scientists who do this kind of, kind of research were like, oh, you know, if this happened, then our entire research field is gone, right? The idea that you should make viruses more dangerous in order to prevent a pandemic. See, I don't think it would have been so bad if it weren't for American scientists working with Chinese labs, as it happened for many years. That, you know, if, if American scientists were only working in America or, you know, in Europe, friendly liberal democracies, like it wouldn't have been a problem for them to criticize because they could still say, oh, well, you know, how we do things here is safe. It was the China stuff that was wrong. And it's even worse than that, though, because, 
you know, the New York Times loses their bureau, the Wall Street Journal loses their bureau, NBC loses their Olympics broadcasting contract. All these threats that the Communist Party is able to to hold over us, and they may not even have to say them. They're not. They're not going to be like, oh well, if you say this, then we're going to do this. It's way vaguer than that. Like it's just this kind of general fear of losing access to that market or having other consequences that are- I mean, or they'll do something like what they did to Australia or Lithuania, and then you have a concrete example, or they kick out some New York Times reporters. Right. Or, you know, so they'll do things so that you'll know what they'll do to you. Kill the chicken to scare the monkeys. Yeah. Well, well, part of the problem is like what Jim was saying is like, we don't recognize the threat of the Chinese Communist Party. For most of COVID, it was more, you know, if you, if, eh, the media was mostly focusing on like left, right political issues in the US. It's, you know, people protesting lockdowns are far right white supremacists. Like the real threat, that's the real threat. Well, I think part of that is because actually in the beginning, like we had a huge bump in subscribers when COVID yeah. started because people were concerned and they kind of started realizing that we should pay attention to China. Mm hmm. But because of like all of the vested interests that we have, because of the World Health Organization has, you know, been bought off because- Politicians, you know, media. Yeah, like, so then that part of it could not be talked about. Like it took more than a year before suddenly people were allowed to say, uh, on, you know, like before uh, some, uh, sci like some science writers and journalists started publishing things that people were actually like, oh, wait, because people have been talking about that before, but they were not like, okay, they're not credible enough to be listened to, et cetera, et cetera. And then, you know, YouTube would yank your, uh, you know, channel or your uh, videos. I mean, it's still going on. Yeah. We just had an episode removed on China Inscripted uh, for medical misinformation, an interview we did with Lori Garrett, who, uh, you know, worked with the Council on Foreign Relations. She's an expert. On. She's yeah. She had she's a Pulitzer Prize winning science writer, but you know now it's like I don't even know. I wonder if somebody reported it for some reason because like it's, I don't. It's really strange. It it that that was from February twenty twenty. So like the argument that people are being medically misinformed by something that nobody is going to go back to February twenty twenty and be like, well, how should I, you know, treat COVID? Like, yeah. Yeah. So. Because we didn't know a lot. It wasn't of even that. called COVID. It was called the Wuhan virus back then, I don't know. according to Chinese state media. Well, no, they stopped that in January. To yeah, be fair, but I think but like, yeah, it like, was such a different era. And in February 2020, like there was no idea in America, except in a very very small group of people, that this was going to be a thing that was going to cause a problem in the U.S. I do remember talking about masks being unnecessary or something like that, because that is what. The, that That's is what, what we the were guidance being told. was at the time. Yeah. yeah. So it was just kind of that is kind of absurd. Mm -hmm. But, you know, up until what the summer of 2021, you couldn't like if you talked about a lab leak being the cause of the first uh, the pandemic, then you were going to get strikes on your channel. Right? right. Even as a as a hip, hypothesis, I can't even get that word out. Hypothesis. Yeah. Right. Like. And like, you know, we still don't know what the truth is. It's still like, this is a hypothesis that has more strength than a na the natural origin hypothesis. Well, so Shelly, the point you were making is uh, the, the idea that America needed a bloody nose and that COVID should have been it, but it wasn't. Because there were a lot of people who had the vested interests in keeping that quiet. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like where was the outrage that, you know, the Chinese Communist Party was essentially like nationalizing com American companies like 3M by preventing 3M from exporting masks that they were making in China to the U.S. Like it was just, well, we can't go there. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think that is part of what we're talking about with Jim, with the military stuff, too, where like China does really aggressive things. Um, the Chinese officials, uh, you know, will write white, white papers about taking Taiwan, et cetera, et cetera, the Wolf War diplomacy stuff. And then there will be people who are like, oh, well, they're, they don't mean it. Yeah. Like we are the people who are saying, oh, not only not us, but like Western people are saying, OK, that's not something we should take seriously. Yeah. Which which scares me, because like if COVID was not the bloody nose that it took, what What's the next, what will it take? 
Or what, what if it is an invasion of Taiwan and we still have the same problem of, you know, Western experts saying, yeah, it's not, it's not a problem. I mean, people are preemptively saying, yeah. right? Yeah. Like, yeah. And if that rules the day, if you, you know, if anyone criticizing China invading Taiwan gets censored, what do we do? I don't have a good answer to that. Wow. Yeah. Well, wow, that's, that's a horrifying thought. I mean, this is why we talk about having to get ahead of it, right? Mm -hmm. Like when Ian Easton comes on and talks about deterrence or whatever, that you have to try to, or Jim talks about like, we have to try to get people to care now before there is a terrible thing that happens. Yeah. The problem is just the enemies are not abroad. I mean, they are. They're in the house. Well, thank you for watching this episode of China Unscripted. Uh, you know, speaking of getting like, you know, kind of future proofing, we, and since we just had an episode removed, we do have a China Unscripted Patreon account. Um, I also will post episode, our, our podcast episodes on our China Uncensored Locals account. Uh, so that, you know, this is where we can future proof ourselves. Yeah. And of course we have our website, chinaunscripted.com. You can go to as well for all the dot episodes. Com? It's, it's, it's com. And, and uh, as well as we have Spotify, uh, Stitcher. Apple iTunes and Stitcher yeah. as well. So yeah, thanks. Thanks for joining us. Uh, I'm glad you are being educated about these issues. Be sure to tell your friends and family because that's, that's what this is going to take. Look at, I'm Chris Chappell. I'm Shelley Zhang. And I'm Matt Ganeshta. We'll talk to you next time.